I met Polly uh, mm -hmm. when I was carrying mail. That was, uh, it's been uh, about 29 years ago. I began carrying mail in Batesburg and I, of course, was put on her route and uh, we'd go by there and they were just, that's just the type of people she and Agnes were. They had to get to know you, you know. They wanted to know who was bringing their mail. I've known Pauline and the Christakis family all my life. Well, Pauline's sort of like family to me. I've known her my whole life. Um, she was dear friends of my mother's and my father's. Um, I don't remember Christmas without Pauline. Probably in the early 50s, uh, I got, she, uh, she worked for a day at the restaurant. At our wedding reception here in town is probably where I met her. We had just arrived in Colombia in 1984. And um, there was a function at the church, uh, which was a very small hall at the time where our kitchen is today. And my mama was visiting here from Greece. So we went and mother was very observant. She was looking at everybody. And all of a sudden she said, those two women, they are from our area. And I said, I started laughing. I said, mama, it can't be. She says, yes, they are from our area. So she approached them and she asked them where they are from and uh, she found out that they were from the little town that my grandmother was from. And we always laugh about that. I said, how did you know that they were from Anoya? She said, something about their face and their nose that gave them away that they were from that particular, from the Christakos family. So that was our first meeting and 30 years later, we are still wonderful friends. My mother's family um, and Pauline's family came from the same area in Greece. So when they came to this country, they were, you know, everybody was really close then because, you know, you, you stayed with, with the people you were close to because that's what you understood. Now, Pauline's father was from the same village that my father and mother were from in Greece. It's called Anoya, and they were there. And my daddy knew Mr. Chris, Uncle Chris, we called him Theo Christo in Greek, uh, because my father came over here and the Christo came at the same time, I guess. I don't know. My dad came over when he was 11. His daddy put him on a ship, and he was coming to America. And he had to stay with his was a cousin, a uncle. And they, he had five boys, so they, daddy made six. After my mother came, when her father brought her to visit her sister. Daddy had gone to Norfolk for some reason, and he went to the baptism where Mama was, and he saw Mama, and he said, that's the woman I want to marry. And they were married in a year's time. And then uh, my mother never did go back to Greece. Their mother was very kind, uh, wonderful lady. When we first met, uh, many, many times we would sit around this table and they would tell us stories about their mother. And my feeling is that the way that they were shaped, it, you know, it was from their mom. Pauline was exactly like her mother. Very, very kind and good. She was, everyone called her in Batesburg, Miss Chris but she was my Thea, that's aunt in Greek, and I always called her Thea. Mama Chris um, was one of the most loving people that I ever known. Polly always talked about her family. She just loved her family. She would talk about her, 
of her mother and her father, you know, and she'd tell me stories about them, and we'd laugh about things that happened, and she she was always, I think, a lot like her mama, because she would tell me things that her mom would do, and I could see the resemblance of uh, Polly and her mother. My mother, she couldn't speak any English at all when she came over, and when she had us, she still, she would, um, talk to us in Greek. When my sister started the school in the first grade, we had a neighbor that would come over and she would listen to Tuli read. And Mama would sit there and listen too. So she learned how to read and she could go to the library and get a book and read. Mother Chris was my mentor. I had bright red hair and Mother Chris um, solved the problem for me. The kids at school called me Carrot Top and kind of upset me a little bit and I came home and uh, I ran over to Mother Chris's and uh, she said, darling, she said, uh, you're not a Carrot Top. She said, you've got golden hair. Well, that solved that problem real quick. Her family, her father was a, well, they are a Greek family, and um, her father um, owned Chris's Cafe, and so uh, they were very uh, prominent folks in the community. Everybody loved them. They never had to want for anything. Their father was a good, good man. He was a very loud man, and, and he was a little teeny man, but a loud man. The, their dad was a wonderful man, but his place was in the business. But my dad, he started having little heart attacks. Nothing was gonna help him but rest. Well, daddy would try to work. He'd work a week and then he'd have to lay out a week. And my mother went and she knelt down in the pantry and prayed and told God to please help her. That she had five children and she didn't know the language and that um, her husband was not well. And the next day, this cousin of Daddy's came. His name was Pete Christakis. He told Daddy, he said, I heard that you weren't doing good and I knew that you had five children. He said, I'm not married and I'm not working anywhere. If y'all give me a place to stay, to sleep, I'll work and sit, pay the rent and see that these children have milk and bread. And my mother has so much faith that when she knelt down to pray, she knew that God was going to help her, and which my dad's cousin came the next day. Her mother was a very genteel person, and I think that her character came a lot from her mother. Her sister, on the other hand, God love Ag, we all loved her. But she, uh, she would say what she thought at any given moment, and I think that was more like Pauline's father. But um, her mother was a very genteel person, and I do think that's where she got a lot of her character from. And so Mama told him to plan to stay. So they gave him their bedroom, and we, the seven of us backed up, and stayed in the other two bedrooms. So Uncle Pete stayed with us 14 months and he'd come home in the afternoon and talk with Daddy and play pinochle with Daddy. And that, that helped my dad to, to get well. So um, <laughs> Agnes and I, we learned how to play pinochle. For the longest, we were playing cards every Monday. I said a little escape is play a few cards, you know. Daddy wanted to play pinochle one day, and he asked Agnes, said, come on, let's play pinochle. She said, Daddy, I got to study. He said, I said, come on, let's play pinochle. I got to study. He got mad and threw the cards in the fire. <laughs> Pauline is Pauline like she has been from the time she was a little girl. She had two sisters, 
two brothers, which I know she's told you, um, and every one of them were different, but Pauline was the best. When I was four years old, we still lived in this house across number one highway. And I would always go outside and anybody I'd see, I'd say, hey, hey. And Tuli would say, mama, bring Pauline in. The gypsies will go get her. <laughs> Tula was the one that could shake a finger and scare the devil out of you. She was the, she was the oldest girl. Well, my older sister, if you slept with her, if you touched her, she'd pinch you to move over. <laughs> she thought that she was the oldest and she was supposed to have her way with everything. Arthur was the intellect in the family. In fact, I was in the house when her brother, Arthur, was born. We, he was born at home in Batesburg. The only one that went to college was Arthur. He, he started saying that when he was eight years old, he was going to be a doctor. He was going to be a doctor. And so when he finished high school, my daddy told my mama, since you want your son to be a doctor, you're going to have to work too. So she started working in the restaurant too. Arthur was a bookworm, and Mama told him, she said, you're going to have to do something that uh, you don't have to use your hands. You better study. <laughs> and Arthur went to Duke four years, and he went to medical college in Charleston four years. Then he went to New York and studied up there for two years, and then he met this girl in Durham, and they got married, and they had four children, two boys and two girls. It was always Agnes and Pauline. They were always together. And we thought that they were two wonderful human beings. Agnes is the one that made you laugh. Agnes, yep, she was, she was a trip. I remember Pauline and Agnes and their 78 records and uh, all of the shenanigans. Our priest came up by one day. He'd been to Augusta and he was going back to Columbia. And he'd always stop in. And my daddy would usually be sitting back here. And he said that daddy reminded him of Theodore Roosevelt. And he'd say, charge, Colonel. And uh, he came in and he said, it's just been so hot. And he said, can I go in the bathroom and wash my face? We told him, yeah. So he took his glasses off and put them on the kitchen table. And when he left, Agnes took her glasses off and put them on the table and took his. And when he came back out, he, he picked up those glasses and he, and he looked at Agnes. He said, you worry, what, what have you done? He said, where are my glasses? <laughs> he said, you going to come up to take communion one Sunday and I'm going to call you a worry ward. I'm not going to call you by your name. <laughs> but she was always doing a prank on somebody. She said what she thought. She didn't, she didn't mince words. Whatever came up, came out. <laughs> she, she's, uh, she's like, kind of like Polly, but she's just a little different. She, say what on her mind, no matter what it was or who it was too, you know. Would. Agnes could straighten you out too, but sweet Pauline, she was always a compromiser and a very loving person. Nick, he didn't like to study. He worked with his hands, so he got a job working on the, on the railroad, and he was working with the, the machine that took up old cross tiles and put down new ones, and he loved what he was doing. He worked eight years on the railroad. Well, he was just a sweetie pie. He never complained after he found out he had multiple sclerosis. Pauline and Agnes were very dedicated to their brother Nick, um, who had MS. And, and Nick was very special to me also. Now see, it, it almost makes me cry when I think about it. He went to have his eyes checked. 
and it was a young man that went to school with him. And one day he came home from work and he told Mama, he said, Mama, Chapman didn't know what he was doing. I can't see out of these glasses. And he took them off and he was twirling them and he hit the table and it, they were plastic and it broke up half and two. And Mama said, okay now, Nick, you can go back to him now and tell him that you can't see out of them. So he went back and he told him, he said, well, come on back and let's check them. And he told him he didn't like what he saw, that he saw multiple sclerosis setting up in his eyes and he wanted him to go and have a physical. So he went to our local doctor, Dr. King, and he sent him to Charleston down at the medical college. And he stayed in the hospital down there 10 days. And when he came out, he had hand crutches. Well, that nearly broke my mama's heart. She had a heart attack that night, my mother. So they put her in the hospital. And she stayed in the hospital, I don't know, two weeks, I think. And uh, she got over 200 get well cards. And those people just couldn't believe it. But that's just the way Batesburg was at that time. And my mother and daddy came a long ways. They, they've been through hard times. And uh, I was real proud of them. But Nick never complained. He always smiled. He always would say he was fortunate to have two sisters that wanted to keep him at home. And uh, wherever we went, we took him. And instead of looking out the window to see what was going on, he'd sit. Uh, I'd sit in his wheelchair by by the stretcher, and he'd be looking at me. I said, Nick, you can look at me any time. I said. Look out the window and see what's going on. <laughs> but uh, he, he wasn't a bad patient. He was always good. She took care of him. Um, she was very good to him. She waited on him hand and foot. She would go to work. She would come home at lunch. She would take care of him. Um, she was up half the night with him, and then she'd still get up. and and go to work, but she had, had done that as well with her mother and her father, and um, just, just very good at taking care of others. After that, Agnes started cooking. She, would, uh, she took the kitchen over, and my daddy would tell Mama, old lady, Agnes has passed you. She's, she's cooking better than you did. <laughs> Those ladies were wonderful cooks. When they had the Greek festival, you have to call Pauline and let Pauline know that Bilo's, uh, Walmart's, uh, what was Reed's, um, has butter on sale. And if they had a limit on it, um, everybody had to go collect butter for so she could make her uh, make her famous uh, pound cakes, and uh, she just filled, filled the freezer up. Um, she was a tenacious um, baker, as was her sister Agnes. At the Greek festival, she baked all the pound cakes, and she makes about 20, 30. It depends. They used to bake them together with Agnes, and Pauline continued that tradition even though she is on her own. Her table would be full of cakes. I mean, you'd walk in and you'd get the aroma of cake because I'd say, Pot, how many cakes you gonna bake? She said, as many as I have to, I'll freeze some of them because I'm gonna, she loved doing that to give to her church. She does it for our big festival that we are having here in Columbia or Greek festival that we had. She just done something for a friend that's getting married, she's gonna make little, uh, she made little hearts out of these and she had to pat them out by hand, every one of them, and she made like 200, I think, or something like that. I think that's just her way of showing other people love, feeding your soul. She always wanted to show people she cared about them. And I think that was her way to do that.
and still does. She still goes to the Greek festival and cooks in Columbia and um, bakes and always brings me a treat back um, still to this day. I don't know anybody that she's ever said no to. You ask her to do something, even bake a cake, or if, if you said, come and take care of me, she would come. The thing that I remember most about Pauline is that she's probably the sweetest, nicest person I've ever met in my life. Uh, the ultimate caregiver, she took care of her parents, she took care of her brother, she took care of her sister, she took care of everybody. Um, if anybody ever needed anything, Pauline is the one that they went to and, and there was just no question. She's, she's probably the closest thing to an angel that we have around here. She took care of her mama and her daddy, and, who, and her brother was sick with MS. And uh, they, they took care of him right here. I mean, you know, they didn't put him nowhere or nothing else. And, uh, and that's, that would be a task for anybody, you know. But they haven't, and like I say, she's always been that way to everybody. Um, if somebody's sick, she try to send them something or take them something or, you know, whatever she can do to help them out. My mother used to call her an angel because she was always that way. Mama used to say, Pauline is the angel in the family, and she was. She took care of her family, her mother, her father, all of them, everybody. Pauline is the one that has done everything. Polly, anybody she meets is like um, uh, no stranger to her. She meets people and, uh, you know, she reaches out to them. She reaches out to anyone, especially if she hears that people are sick in the community, she's going to fix something. Or I've seen at times she would say, um, I would tell her so-and-so was in the hospital, and she would immediately write it down, and the next day I would pick up a card. She was, she was always sending cards to people in the community. She was always, like I say, fixing cakes for people in the community. Pauline would grab every opportunity to be of help to somebody whenever it was needed. She's always there uh, to step up and say, yes, I'll do it or I'll be there if you need me. Pauline uh, had told us a few times about how much she wanted to be a nurse. And talk about picking the right profession for yourself. Definitely she has affected me in a big way. And um, one thing that I will always carry with me it's a, it's a phrase of Pauline's, whenever problems arise and you talk with Pauline, she has a very calm manner and she would say, which translates, everything will be done according to his will. For someone that knows Pauline, they know exactly what it means when she says, Ola thayinune. And I will carry that with me always. It's a wonderful phrase. Not to get frustrated about situations or impatient, you know, just leave it in God's hands. There's few people like her. Oh. I found her to be, a, be an inspiration to me. Even when, you, when you're down, you come by here and she's taking care of a brother. You know, you just make you feel 100% better because she, you could say she cared, you know, and did everything she could for him. You just don't find people like that every day. Pauline is very much a role model to me, somebody that um, I've always looked up to. She is always doing for others. She's very... Um, selfless. She takes, has always taken care of everybody. She still calls me and asks me if there's anything she can do for me. She was just an inspiration, I think, to, to me and to everybody. Polly just uh, always cared about people and uh, she always took them things and uh, we laughed. She was a person I could laugh with a person that if I had problems, I could cry with. You know, I'd stop by there, and I, if I'm sad, I would talk to Polly. 
and she would listen. She was a very good listener. Uh, my impressions of, of Pauline is that she's just, she's just really a sweet person. She's so kind and so good. I mean, I, I tell you, I wish sometimes I could be half of what she is. But I can't be. I get mad sometimes. She's just a nice person. I mean, I never heard anybody say anything other than what I'm telling you about what a wonderful person she is. She's kind of like your most unforgettable character. You know, you meet one of them like one of them in a lifetime. Just a fine, fine person that you hope that you can model your life after in some kind of way. A lot of people probably would say the same thing about her. She's just one of these people that does everything for everybody. She does everything for everybody. I was in Sheila's one day and this lady asked me, she says, how old are you? And I didn't even know this lady. And uh, I said, I'm gonna be 90 in August. She said, 90? What do you contribute this to? She said, you don't look like you 90. I said, well, the first thing I didn't get married. And the second thing, I never did go to the doctor. And she said, that's it, you didn't get married. <laughs> I used to, I'd say, Paul, you need to go, go get a physical, go to the doctor. She said, oh, I'm not gonna go to the doctor. I don't wanna take in all that medicine. And I, as of now, I don't think she takes very much medicine. She's not a person that runs to the doctor. And you know, she's never been to a doctor in her life until just a few years now ago. Never. Being 90, turning 90 or 90 today, she um, still drives to Columbia. I hope I can do that when I'm her age. She uh, still cooks. Um, she still goes to visit and has her friends over. Um, and her whole life has been an example to others and what we should be, because really, that's what we're here for, is to take care of each other. And I think she has shown me that through my life, um, that it is important to take care of others, and she has been an inspiration in my life, and my whole life. She knows that she's been blessed, you know, in her 90 years. I wish that she has a very, very happy birthday. Uh, taking on being 90 years old is pretty big. Pauline, happy 90th birthday. I hope you have many, many more. We had a wonderful time for your 70th birthday, Pauline, at Silly's. And we all acted kind of silly, but we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I remember your, your 80th birthday that Gene gave out at his house. And we, we had so much fun. And for the 90th, we are all going to be there, and we are going to have a great time. We love you, and we wish you many, many more healthy and happy and wonderful. And we wish you to reach 100, Natai Katostesis. Meijia Kehara. We love you. Pauline, today is your special day, and I want you to celebrate. For 23 years, you've been my best friend, my client, and really family. What more could I ask for to have a family like you? You're so generous, not just to me, to everyone you meet. You are always generous, kind, and with that smile. You have been an inspiration and inspired women like me that's coming along right behind you. You're such an encouragement. So I want to thank you for the legacy that you will always have with me. We are grateful that we have time to honor you. You have been in our lives and you've done so much for us. And now it's time that we do for you. Thank you for letting us celebrate your birthday for you. 
And I hope you have many, many more. And I'm looking forward to that 100th birthday because I plan to celebrate it again with you. And I love you very, very much.